So, how did you guys do on responsibility? It's been two weeks, so you had ample time. So we don't have any great spiritual insights on responsibility this week, huh? Well, if you guys are going to be irresponsible about responsibility, we'll move along. This is the last of the Musar we're going to do. So we're going to do faith. The Hebrew word for faith is emunah. A couple of things to think about as we go through this. Faith and belief are not the same thing, and faith and trust are not the same thing. They mean different things. And one of the things that happens in our society is we tend to sort of smoosh all those things together, and I'm suggesting to you that that's probably not a good idea. So let's talk about faith and what it is and perhaps what it isn't. First off, I say faith is not belief. You can't have faith without belief, but simply believing is not itself faith. I believe in God. Well, what's that mean? Does that mean I have faith in God? Or do I merely believe that He exists? Or do I believe that He's going to do what He said He's going to do? Or any number of things I can believe about God, but none of those necessarily involve faith. And similarly, trust is closer, but still not quite the same thing. What does trust mean? Confidence that something is going to be or do what it says. But notice that's not quite the same as faith. Faith is how we deal with the future. We live in the present. And as we've said many times, the past is not something you can do anything about because that's past. The future is not something you can do anything about because it hasn't happened yet. The only thing that you can do anything with is the present. That's when you live. So how do you deal with the fact that you are moving through time into a place that you don't know what's going to happen next? Faith is how you deal with the fact that you only exist in the present and you are moving into a future that you don't know. Now, some things are so close and so certain that the amount of faith that you exercise is not very great. And the example that I use is if I sit down or stand up on a chair, I have faith that that chair is not going to collapse under me. Otherwise, I wouldn't sit down. I don't know what's going to happen, but I have faith that the chair is going to do what the chair has always done, and the chair is going to continue to hold me up. In the case of trust, what you're doing is you're believing in a promise, if nothing else, and certainly I'm trusting that the chair will hold me up. But the mechanism that I use is faith to get me there. In the trivial example of a chair, not a lot of faith involved there. I mean, it's held me up thousands of times in the past, and I trust or have faith that it will hold me up again in the future. So I don't really have to think about that. And the reason I'm saying this that way is to get you all to think about what faith really means, not to get you to go around looking at every chair with suspicion. I don't want you to get into your car and wonder, when I turn the steering wheel, is it going to go left or right? When I hit the brakes, is it going to stop? I don't want to cast doubts in your mind about every trivial little thing you do. What I want to do is get you to understand that the mechanism that enables you to move into the future with some sort of confidence is faith. A corollary to what I just said is faith is how we deal with the unknown. Because by definition, the future is unknown. What is the ultimate unknown? One of the things that's an ultimate unknown is what happens to us after death. God is the ultimate unknown. God tells us as much about himself as we need to know. I will tell you, we do not have any inkling of what we don't know about God. We think we can imagine, but all that is is extrapolation from the things that he has told us about himself. So when I say faith is how we deal with the unknown, the ultimate unknown that we are trying to deal with is God himself. Now, this is where we start becoming different between faith and trust. They're not quite the same, but they're very close. They're certainly related. If you have faith in something, you will then place your trust in it. And as we start reaching farther out to the unknown, that's where trust is not the appropriate 
vehicle, faith then becomes the appropriate vehicle. Now, one of the things that we've talked about lots and lots of times in here is we exist in a world that we believe is created by God. And I personally believe that this world was created by God for me to learn. In other words, there's things that this world will provide to me that God knows that I need in order for me to become what he wants me to be, whatever that is. And I don't think anybody ultimately has any idea what it is God wants me to be. But he certainly wants me to be something very different than I was at 20. And so what God has done is he provided a place for me to be and to live and to grow. And there's sort of two things. Thing one is if he's too close to me, then I will not stretch, grow, develop, go through difficult times, and through those difficult times, learn and grow. Similarly, if he's too far away, then my tendency is to think that this is all there is. And I then become someone who, he who dies with the most toys wins, you know, that kind of philosophy. So for all of us, God has got to have a balance of not being so close that we never grow and not being so distant that we lose hope. And so what he's done is he's given us his word. He's given us a sense of eternity. It's what it says in Ecclesiastes, remember? God has put a sense of eternity into you. Larry was talking about it this morning. He runs into people who have a desire for something, but they don't really know what it is. And they don't recognize that the thing that they ultimately desire is a relationship with God. But the fact that it's built into them to desire this is proof, if you would need proof, that God exists. Because that yearning has no evolutionary use. A dog doesn't have that yearning. A deer doesn't have that yearning, yet they go along, they do doggy and deery things, they eat and reproduce and all that kind of stuff, and as far as I know, they don't have this thing inside of them that tells them that there's something more, that there's something that they desire, that there's something that they're trying to get to. That's put into us by God, and it's part of the mechanism where he maintains a balance between transcendence, which is to say so far out that we have no idea that he exists and can't relate to him at all, and imminence, which means that he's too close. It's sort of like I described the camp of the children of Israel where you've got the very presence of God in the middle of the camp, and I've described that as having a tiger in the middle of the camp and his chain is too long. So God spent a lot of time with Israel to sort of get the project jump-started, and then he backs out because we need some distance in order to develop. This is Hebrews quoted from Habakkuk. Yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. If he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. So faith becomes, if you will, an essential part of the mechanism by which you exist in God's kingdom and you become a productive member of that kingdom. Abraham believed and God accounted it to him for righteousness. So all over the Torah, the idea that Faith is rewarded by God. Adon Olam. I've been talking around that. The words mean Adon, master. Olam is typically translated as the universe. But that's not what the root of the word means. Olam means hidden. If you go to a Hebrew root dictionary and you look up Olam, the definition is hidden. And that's what I've been talking about, metaphor that I would use. You would be an absolutely perfect driver if God put a state trooper in the passenger seat of your car. And the state trooper's driving around with you everywhere you go, and he's got his ticket book out, and his pension depends on how many tickets he writes. I will guarantee you that you would all just be exemplary drivers. You would not go two miles over the speed limit. You would not do a rolling stop through a stop sign. You would not do any minor infraction. And that would be what would happen to you if God was too close. And then, of course, the other one is they've had situations where the police department goes on strike for a week, and all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose. And people look around and say, aha, 
this is a really good opportunity for me to settle a score here. And they do. One of the things that God puts into us is a sense of morality. Almost the first words a two-year-old learns is, it's not fair. And we all have this sense of right and wrong. Now, it can be miseducated, and a lot of things are not in themselves right or wrong. And again, I've used this example lots of times. You can steal a sheep anywhere in the world, and they will have a way to deal with you. God also says, this is what you do with somebody who steals a sheep. So God gives a method for Israel to deal with a stolen sheep. So the sense of morality that any given culture has varies. But there are some things that are pretty much universal. Murder, adultery, those kinds of things. And those are wired into us by God. And again, that is a indication to your friend who's looking for something that that something that he looks for is the one that created him because that's built into him. I mean, if you try and cheat him out of a case of tortillas, he'll come talk to you or vice versa. And furthermore, if you confront him about cheating you out of a case of tortillas, he will probably turn red realizing he's been caught. And that's his internal sense of morality operating. And the fact that he has that is a reason for faith. Transcendence versus eminence. Transcendence is the part of God that we can't contemplate. And, and again, there's no reason we should be able to contemplate it. You've got a brain that's about that big around. You've got a limited amount of bandwidth. That brain of yours is not capable simply because it doesn't have enough connections to completely understand the transcendence of God. Yet God is involved in his creation. That's what imminence is. So transcendent is the aspect of God, if you will, that is beyond your understanding. And really all you need to know about that is that it's there because you can't know anymore. And then the imminent part of God is his relationship to you. Finally, knowledge versus experience. You can read the Bible and you can believe every word in that Bible. But that is not the same as experiencing the goodness of God. Since you started keeping Shabbat, your life has changed. You're not the same as you used to be. You may or may not be able to put a finger on what that is, but you know you're different. That's experience. That's why God says in the Psalms, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste, experience. And in order to experience, you have to do it. Experience is intimate and real. Whereas knowledge is not. I can read books, scriptures, everything, but until I actually get down and do what God says to do, I don't have the experience of it, and consequently it doesn't change me. There are lots and lots of scholarly theologians who know the Bible better than you do, but they don't live it. And I'm not saying all theologians don't live the Bible. I'm saying there are people who are Bible scholars who know the Bible better than you do, who do not live by the Bible because they don't regard it as true and real. It is simply an academic exercise to them. They have knowledge, but they have no experience. And it's experience that makes it real. It's experience that leads you to understand that you can trust it. So the first time I dropped my oversized butt into a chair and it held me up, now I have experience. So the next chair I approach, I am far less wary about than the first one I approach. That's experience. One of the problems that a lot of people have is they got dragged to Sunday school as little kids. They got taught all the little Sunday school stories. And then they quit going to church and they didn't have any relationship with God. So their faith is frozen at a fifth grade level. A fifth grade level of faith is not appropriate for a man or a woman of 40. I had a friend who was dying. He since died. And... He called me up and he said, I'm dying and that's okay. I just wanted to talk to you before I left. He was not a believer. I tried to talk to him about God and so forth. And his level of faith was at a child's level, not childlike faith, but a child's level of understanding and faith. And he just couldn't wrap his head around. He was okay with dying. He understood that that was going to happen, and, and he was okay with that. But as far as he was concerned, he was just expecting to go out of existence, which is really very sad. And his problem was that 
his faith was stalled somewhere in Sunday school where he'd had a bad Sunday school teacher or had a bad experience in Sunday school or something like that. And his faith had never grown beyond that. So at the end of his life, he was stoic. That's what stoicism is. He was accepting what was happening, but not really interested in this God of mine. And that time I was still an Episcopalian. And he had a real bad experience with Episcopal Church and wasn't interested in any of that. So the deal here is the stories that are told in Sunday school are true. I'm not suggesting that those stories are not true. What I'm suggesting is that they are aimed at a child. And if that's where you stop, when you get to a place in your later life where you need a more substantial faith, it's not going to be there. Again, Ecclesiastes, the end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, every secret thing, whether good or evil. And this goes back to our innate sense of fairness. We think that things should be fair, or at least as we perceive fairness. You know, now, understand, everybody perceives fairness from his own perspective. That's why we have judges that are not beholden to either party because both parties think that the whole thing is unfair and you need a neutral judge to tell them one of you or both of you that you're both full of cornflakes. Certainly a lot of our judges have become corrupt but I also think that a lot of that corruption is at a high political level and if you are trying to settle a question of your dog pooped in my yard they'd probably do a pretty good job. It's sort of like the unjust judge in scripture where the guy is firmly corrupt, but he is perfectly capable of judging the widow's case properly. So the fact that the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals is fundamentally entirely corrupt doesn't mean that they don't get some of that stuff right. But the point is this innate desire for justice and this innate desire that it all should make sense once we stand before the ultimate judge, That's an act of faith, and that's put into you by God. He builds that faculty into you as part of the imminence part of it. In other words, you have this transcendent God that you really can't relate to, but the imminent part is he has put this desire for justice and this belief that it's all going to come out in a fair and equitable way when he finally does the judgment. That's built into you by God. Onward. And remember, I've talked to you about knowledge versus experience. One of the biggest builders of faith is to develop a sense of awe. Because you cannot look at a grain of wheat or a flower or a mountain and believe that they are there accidentally. And the problem that most of us have as we go through our lives is, it's like with my chair example, I don't think about having faith in a chair anymore. I have sat on too many chairs. It is simply blah. There's a chair. I'm going to sit down. Don't think about it at all. So what I'm suggesting that you do this week is start looking deeper into common things around you and develop a sense of awe as to what's actually there as opposed to, oh, I got dandelions in my yard. I got to mow. Think about what a dandelion really is. It's an amazing little machine absolutely ruthless and fearless, will invade anywhere. Tough little plant. Use your own example. You can find a thousand of them every day. Now, don't get stalled so that you contemplate every chair before you sit down. I mean, I'm not suggesting that you get stalled out. But what I am suggesting is work purposefully on your sense of awe this week. And interestingly, in Hebrew, the word for awe can either be translated as awe or fear. It's the same word. So in all of your Bible translations where it says fear God, and this is perfectly appropriate because the signature behavior of anybody that is confronted in the Bible with an angelic being is he needs to go change his linen. People literally go down and are in terror at angelic beings. So fear is a perfectly appropriate 
translation. You know, if a pillar of fire were to appear here in the middle of the room, I think most of us would need a change of linen. But the other one is awe. So where it says fear God, you can look at it as be afraid of God, and that's entirely appropriate. Or you can look at it as be in awe of a transcendent and powerful God, and that's also a good translation. So when I'm saying develop a sense of awe, what I'm suggesting that you do is, as you go through your life this next week, stop and pay attention to what is actually going on around you. Most people don't. And what I'm suggesting to you is, as you experience awe in the presence of the things that God has created, that will help you increase your faith. Because remember, I said, if you still got a grade school level of faith, by the time you're at the age you all, then you've missed out on a whole lot of growth. What you're working on here this week is the difference between knowledge and experience. You all know the scriptures. What we're trying to do this week with faith is increase your experiential knowledge, your experience of God, if you will. And I'm suggesting that the mechanism to make that happen is a sense of awe. Shut